Welcome to Defenders, the teaching class of Dr. William Lane Craig. Today, The Existence of God, Part 24. For more information or resources, go to reasonablefaith.org. We've been talking in the class about the ontological argument, and I laid it out last time, which basically shows that if it's possible that God exists, then it follows that God exists. So the principal issue that needs to be settled with respect to this argument is the first premise, that it's possible that a maximally great being exists. The other steps of the argument are relatively uncontroversial. The really controversial premise is, is it possible that God exists? Now, in dealing with this issue, we need to keep in mind the difference between what we could call epistemic possibility and metaphysical possibility. Now, what do I mean by those terms? Well, epistemic possibility just means for all we know, something is possible. So take some complicated mathematical equation that we might write out on the blackboard here. Say the square root of uh, 176 is, uh, I don't know, 14 or something like that. Well, we, we might say for all we know that could be true, but if it is true, it is necessarily true. Whereas if it's false, it's necessarily false. Uh, mathematical equations are either necessarily true or they're impossible. But epistemically, that is to say as far as we know, we look at that and say, well, uh, it's possible that it's true, it's possible that it's false. And that's correct to say in an epistemic sense. But in a metaphysical sense, it can't really be false if it's true, and it can't be true if it's false. Metaphysical possibility and necessity would mean the way something can actually be. Uh, can something actually be that way? Uh, or is it actually impossible? So, with respect to this first premise, we should resist the temptation to say, well, it's possible that God exists, or it's possible that he doesn't exist. That's true epistemically. For all we know, it's possible that God exists, it's possible he doesn't exist. But if a maximally great being exists, he exists necessarily in this metaphysical sense. And therefore God's existence is either possible or impossible. So the atheist has to maintain that God's existence is metaphysically impossible in order to avoid this argument. Whereas the defender of the argument thinks that God's existence is not merely epistemically possible, for all we know God exists, he thinks that God's existence is metaphysically possible as well. So the question is, well, do we have any reason to think that the existence of God, of a maximally great being, is metaphysically possible as opposed to just epistemically possible? Is there any reason to think this first premise is true in a metaphysical sense of possibility? Well, I think that there is a reason for that. Intuitively, the idea of a maximally great being is a coherent idea. When you think about the notion of a being that is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every logically possible world, that seems to be a perfectly coherent idea. In order for the ontological argument to fail, the concept of God needs to be metaphysically impossible. It needs to be logically incoherent, like the idea of a married bachelor or a round triangle. Those things clearly are metaphysically impossible because they're incoherent. But when you think about the idea of a, uh, of a maximally great being, there's nothing in that concept that appears to be even remotely incoherent. Indeed, I think we have a positive grasp of that concept as a coherent idea. And if that's correct, that provides some intuitive basis for thinking that this first premise is true, that it's possible that a maximally great being exists. Now, one of the main reasons that is often given for doubting the first premise of the ontological argument 
uh, and this is a very ancient strategy, is that if this type of reasoning is correct then we ought to be able to think up parodies of the argument. Uh, thinking of other sorts of things that would then have to exist. For example, the idea of a most perfect island um, would be one that exists in every logically possible world and uh, has all of the great making properties to make up a, a, a perfect island and therefore there must exist something like this. Or the concept of a necessarily existing lion would be the concept of a lion that exists in every possible world and so therefore uh, a necessarily existent lion must exist. These notions also seem to be coherent and therefore if it's possible there's a necessarily existent lion then there must be one or if it's possible that there's uh, a maximally great island then there must be one which is absurd. But I think that the arguments proponent can defend his argument against these sort of parodies by arguing that these supposedly parallel notions aren't really analogous to the idea of a maximally great being. For one thing, the properties that go to make up maximal greatness have intrinsic maximal values. Things like being all-knowing means knowing all truth. There's a there's a kind of maximum quality there uh, that you can't get beyond. You know all truth. Or being omnipotent, being able to do anything that's logically possible, or being all good. These have intrinsic maximal values. By contrast, something like a most perfect island or a maximally great island doesn't seem to have those kind of intrinsic great making properties. Um, in the case of islands, for example, th there could always be more palm trees and, and more hula girls uh, to increase the uh, greatness of the island. And, and it's not even obvious what the intrinsic properties of a, gr of a greatest possible island would be. That seems relative to your interests. Uh, do you think a great island is a remote desert island where you can be by yourself? Or is a great island one that is bursting with fine resort hotels? and all sorts of entertainment. Well, it's relative to the interests of the vacationer. So the idea of a greatest island or a most perfect island really turns out not to be a coherent idea. There, there aren't intrinsic maximal values or even objective properties that go to make up uh, the excellence of islands. And the idea of a necessarily existing lion as well, I think, is also incoherent. Just think about it. In order to be such an animal, this beast would have to exist in every logically possible world. But that would mean that in a world in which the universe consisted of nothing but a singularity, just a point of infinite space-time density, uh, pressure, curvature, that there would be this necessarily existing lion. And anything that could exist in a, in a universe which consisted of a simple singularity just isn't what we mean by a lion. A, a lion is a sort of big cat uh, having certain properties and it, it couldn't exist in a universe like that. So clearly uh, a lion is subject to certain sorts of physical limitations in order to be a lion and therefore cannot be coherently conceived to be necessarily existent. This can become almost ludicrous uh, at times. In my debate with Victor Stenger at Oregon State University, in response to the ontological argument, he attempted to parody the argument by saying, well, maybe there's a, a, a maximally great pizza, the greatest possible pizza, and therefore that would have to exist as well. And what I pointed out to him was that a greatest possible pizza would have to exist in every logically possible world and that would mean that it couldn't be eaten, right? Because it's metaphysically necessary. And therefore it wouldn't be a pizza. Because a pizza is something that you can eat. So it, again, it just turns out that these parodies are often incoherent ideas that don't really match the intuitively coherent notion of a maximally great being. One that is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every logically possible world. Any comment or question about that defense
of the first premise so far. Yes, David. First of all, thank you for that uh, explanation of, of uh, epistemic because I was wrestling with that, and that, it's a that, key that, made, a, that made a lot of things clear to me. Yeah. But, but the question then becomes, if you want to, are there arguments or disagreements on what God's characteristics must be? That is, okay, omniscience, yes. yeah, we agree with that, um, you know, omnipresence and so on. But we went over uh, several years ago, I think, characteristics of God. And if God is and, and necessarily has those characteristics, then that would imply that we would all need to ascribe to those characteristics or else that wouldn't be the maximally great being. You know, is he simple, for instance, and things mm -hmm. like that. Would, would uh, someone who wants to argue against that say, well, God doesn't necessarily, the, the maximally great being uh, might not have, and then name some characteristics that would in fact, you know, by, by coming up with a disagreement and putting that forward, that would argue against premise one in a sense. You're absolutely right that there is dispute in this case as well as to what makes for a great making property in God's case. And that's why planning a cash the argument out in terms of relatively uncontroversial properties like being all powerful, all good, and all knowing. But he doesn't say, for example, that the greatest conceivable being would be timeless rather than temporal or simple rather than complex. It's certainly true that some of those properties I think we are less intuitively clear about in terms of whether these are really great making properties. Is a being that exists timelessly greater than one that exists temporally? I think that's far from obvious. And so that's why the argument is couched simply in terms of these three properties. And if there is such a being, then we need to examine further whether or not we have any reasons to think that this being is temporal or timeless, simple or complex. Um, has he revealed himself in the world or has he not? And those can be issues then that can be further explored or maybe even known on the basis of divine revelation. Now those would still be, um, in some cases perhaps, necessary attributes of God, but it's just that we wouldn't have any clear intuitions about them. So the argument is couched simply in terms of those which are pretty indisputable as being great making properties and we leave it an open question as to what other properties this being has. Yes, Bob? It does my heart good to hear your witness to these, especially to the Indians. I can't really share their enthusiasm for this particular argument though. So. <laughs> I, know, I, I, I would know. say <laughs> I, I'm going to have to reject premise one on the, what I consider to be contradictory attributes. But before I give you those, let me just say, Dr. Platinga here has kind of defined himself to victory, it seems to me, by saying that uh, this uh, maximally great being exists in all possible worlds. This is, of course, a possible world. So by definition, here he is, and it's, there is really even no debate. And similarly, I have, and this is, goes beyond this, we won't get into this, but I have a problem with this all logically possible world arguments anyway, because I don't believe there's any world that's logically possible other than the one that we have. But, but anyway, that's... that's but the, I, I don't <laughs> think you really believe that, Bob. That's yes, I really be a do. misunderstanding, because you don't think that everything that happens happens logically necessarily, that you have no free will, for example, that it would be logically impossible for you to lower your hand right now. Well, maybe we have different ideas of what a possible world is. Maybe well, I'm talking I about saying. a possible that, universe you, you, you or something. But I'm everything. saying that I don't think there's any, from my understanding of his possible world, any world that you could conceive of, this being would have to exist in. And this is, and this is why, I, first of all, I don't believe there can be another world besides what we have. Now, the world has various turns and different futures and different things that... But how can there be another, for instance, universe or reality other than the one that we have? All that's, right, now let, let's answer that question by your choosing to do something different. In this world, you will get up and go to lunch, say, in, in a few minutes. Okay. But you have freedom of the will, I believe, right. and you could choose instead to just remain seated, and then a different world would exist than the one that will in fact exist. Well, see, I would, I would say it's the same world. It's just the fact that I have different choices. It's the same world. We all have different choices within the same world. But well, now, it's not the same world in the sense that different events occur. And so if a world is simply a description of the way reality is,
those aren't the same description. They, they have different events in them, and so they're, they're different descriptions. And that's all a world means here, is, is a maximum description of reality. Yeah, I, maybe I'd, I'm not looking at it quite from the way you do. But anyway, here's, okay, here's the situation that I would say. I believe there are contradictory attributes here in, this, in his max, maximally great being. First of all, he says he's maximally great and therefore maximally good. Then he says he exists in all possible worlds. Well, I don't think those two things go together. If you have a maximally great uh, being, there is no way he's going to exist in but a very small minority of all the worlds that we can conjure up because they would be abhorrent to him. Okay. Okay, this is a very good point that Bob is making here. A very good point. Intuitively, we would think that it's logically possible that there would be a world in which there would be no higher life form, say, than rabbits who are diseased and sick and exist in a state of continual pain and suffering. That seems to be logically possible. But I think Bob is quite right in saying God would never permit such a world. He's too good. He wouldn't create such a world. So what that means is that if God does exist, that envisioned world of animal pain and suffering isn't really logically possible after all. That isn't a logically possible world. So what is implied here is that if you believe in God as a metaphysically necessary being, this is going to radically affect your view of what is possible or impossible. Certain things that look like they're possible turn out really not to be possible after all. Another example would be a world in which every human being rejects Christ and goes to hell. I think that's incompatible with the goodness of God, that God wouldn't create such a thing. So what that means is that that really isn't a possible world. That really is a logically impossible or incoherent state of affairs. So you're quite right, Bob, I think in, in your, your intuition here that certain sorts of states of affairs are going to be incompatible with God and his existence. But I think that most Christian philosophers would, rather than deny then that God is metaphysically necessary, which would make God a contingent being, I don't think we want to say that, that God's contingent. What they will prefer to do is revise their views of possible worlds rather than revise their concept of God as being metaphysically necessary and all good. You, you've got to revise something, and I think most of us would say you revise your concept of what's really logically possible rather than revise the concept of God so that he's no longer the greatest conceivable being. Joe, and this will be our last question, then I'll let you go. Good question, though, Bob. That's very thought-provoking. I'm kind of with Bob about your <laughs> enthusiasm over this. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it, ha, ha, two, two questions, that'll be it. One, how do you rhetorically get around the idea that somebody feels like you're loading the dice in your favor from the get-go? I mean, how do you debate when it looks like you're – it looks like in this argument you're saying – well, if you can even conceive him, I win. You know, that, that's – how do you – in a debate with Stanger, I, I haven't heard it yet. Yeah. I was like, I'd like to know how you – did he – Well, I you? think the way you do it would be by making this distinction between epistemic and metaphysical possibility and saying that to affirm that something is metaphysically possible is making a significant truth claim. Um, it wouldn't be significant if we were just talking about epistemic possibility. Then you say, yeah, for all we know, he exists or he doesn't exist. But you're making a significant claim. You're saying it is logically possible that there be a maximally great being having this description of these properties. That's a significant truth claim, I think, to say that that's coherent. But then if you admit it's possible, as Bob says, then the rest just follows. That, that's right. So, so you don't have an issue at all with building, uh, you know, on a metaphysical pragmatism, just constructing an ontology of God by way of... Why do you call it pragmatism? Well, just what you're forced to do 
by way of your mental or noetic faculties that you cut this what follows what seems to right. follow. No, I don't have any problem with that at all. I mean, there's nothing circular about this argument okay. because you're not saying that you believe premise one is true because you believe that God exists. That would be circular. You're saying, as I think about this idea of a being that is all powerful, all good, and all knowing in every possible world, that is an intuitively coherent idea. It's not like a married bachelor or a necessarily existent lion or a maximally great pizza, which are all incoherent. This is a coherent idea and therefore something that possibly exists. And that's a significant truth claim to say that such a thing is possible. But what follows from that is that if it's possible, then it's necessary. Like that mathematical equation, if it's possibly true, it's necessarily true. So you've, at least, let me, let me put it this way, and this is the way I presented it in the debate. At the very least, what the argument shows is that if God's existence is possible, then God must exist. Now, see, that's a conditional claim. You don't have to defend that it's possible that God exists. Just leave that up to your audience. That was what I did in the debate. I, I didn't try to prove that it's possible that a maximally great being exists. I said, just all the argument shows is that if it's possible, then God must exist. So, what do you think? Do you think it's possible that God exists, like I do? Then you should agree that God exists. If you don't think that God exists, then you've got to say that the concept of God is logically incoherent. You've got to affirm it's impossible. Not just that he doesn't exist, but it's impossible that he exists. So, that the conditional statement of that argument, Joe, I think is still very powerful. That if it's possible God exists, if the first premise is true, then God exists. And that in itself, I think, is an important insight. All right, well, we'll look next time at some further objections to the argument and then draw it to a close. The copyright for the content of this recording is held by Dr. William Lane Craig. For more, go to reasonablefaith.org.